it is an absolute pleasure to be with you all today um, and share some of the things that I think are important to know. Um, you know, every time you open the news, there's something different about COVID. Um, so Catherine and I were chatting earlier, and, and this week it was vaccine coming for 12 to 15 year olds next week. We're never going to achieve herd immunity. And sometimes um, the real facts and the most important facts get lost in all that noise. So um, what we're going to do today, I think two things. The first is I'm going to really outline what I think are the most important things to understand about COVID right now. What are the most important things to understand about COVID in the future as we are moving towards a more vaccinated population? Um, and then uh, I'm figuring y'all probably have some questions that you'd like to have answered. So I'm probably gonna try and leave um, a really significant amount of time to just answer any questions that you might have, um, particularly in the midst of all of this um, noise that's coming at us. So I wanted to start out with just putting things into some context. Um, so as of May 3rd, there have been over 150 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 that have been reported to the World Health Organization. Now, one thing I wanna just mention, that number is wrong, flat out, it's wrong. I don't know how wrong it is. I can't tell you what I think it actually could be, but we know that number is wrong and we know it's wrong for a couple of reasons. The first is that for a case of COVID to get reported to the World Health Organization, it has to get diagnosed, which means there has to be sufficient testing in a place. Here in the United States, we had really significant limitations in terms of our testing ability um, early on in the pandemic. So spring and early summer of 2020, those testing limitations still persist throughout the world. Um, the, the other problem is that someone has to go get the test. Um, and I'm sure we all know someone who says, I'm pretty sure I had COVID. I just didn't think I needed to go get tested. So what we see on a global scale is that there have been 152 million confirmed cases. We know the number is much more than that. We just don't know how much. It's also important to note that there have been more than 3 million deaths reported to the World Health Organization. Um, now, the, the good news, over 1 billion vaccine doses have been administered worldwide. When we talk about vaccines a little more um, deeply, we'll talk about some of the disparity that exists and why a billion is an amazing achievement, and yet there are still huge parts of the world that desperately need more doses. I'd also be remiss right now if I didn't mention um, the situations that are occurring in both India and in Brazil. So for six of seven days, beginning on April 21st, India set uh, global records for daily COVID-19 infections. There were more than 300,000 people diagnosed per day. And for all the same reasons we just talked about with knowing that 152 million number is wrong, we know that there were more than 300,000 new infections. When we think about the scope and size of that number, the important thing to remember is that your Indian colleagues or your Indian American colleagues, they know someone in India right now who presumptively has COVID, who has been diagnosed with COVID, who has died from COVID. And, and so we have to acknowledge the massive burden um, that exists globally, as well as the burden that exists for the people with whom we work knowing um, how many new infections are occurring. The additional problem when we look at the situation in India is a lack of resource and lack of capacity. Um, and so we know that we had a massive impact from COVID here in the United States, in California, particularly in the winter post Christmas. Um, but the situation is quite different in India where there is lack of access to supplemental oxygen, there is lack of access to the medications that are needed, there's just lack of physical bed space. Um, and, and it is a clear humanitarian crisis in India and in many parts of Brazil right now. So let's now look a little bit about the situation in the United States. So what we have on the top of this slide, realizing I'm not pointing the slides to you, um, what we have is the CDC's COVID data tracker that gives us sort of the most accurate available information. So you can see that we've now had more than 32 million total cases of COVID-19, nearly 45,000 of which were diagnosed just in the last 24 hours. So while we are making huge progress, it is important to note that there were still 667 new deaths 
across the United States in the last 24 hours. What we have here on the bottom is an epidemic curve, and this is a, a way to visualize sort of the impact and the evolution of the epidemic in the United States. So the very good news is when we look um, at the epidemic curve, we can see that nationally there is a clear and hopefully what will be sustained downward trend. Um, all of which indicates we are on the right track, particularly when we consider that there have been more than 231 million total doses of vaccine that have been administered nationwide. So what's concerning? Um, every time you open your browser, you get a New York Times push alert, wherever it is you are getting your news, practically daily we're hearing about the new COVID-19 variants, or um, as my colleagues and I have taken to calling them, the scariants. Because every time there is one that is identified, there is a concern, is it going to be more dangerous? Is it more transmissible? Oh my gosh, now we're finding this thing. Do our vaccines work? I think there are a couple important things to understand about variants. So viruses like SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, they're kind of like the C students. They make copies of themselves, but they just don't do a very good job copying. And so the more they transmit, the more they copy themselves, the more mistakes they will just happen to make. If they happen to make a mistake that gives them some sort of advantage in the population, for example, it makes it easier for that particular virus to transmit, then we'll start to see more of that virus persisting in the population. So this is something that is totally anticipatable. I might have just made up that word. Um, and it is also something that can be controlled if we can control the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So as we have more people vaccinated, as we have less transmission of the virus, we won't see the generation of variants to the same degree. And part of the way you can help sort of think about this is we really only started to recognize and acknowledge variants at the tail end of 2020. Even though we had seen that the virus had been around for the entirety of 2020, it's just as sort of transmission hit that critical mass that we started to see the variants uh, arise and persist. Now, uh, what you can see here, this is the data visualization from the CDC. These are the variants that they are tracking. Um, and you can see that there are a whole lot of them. And they get divided into VOC, a variant of concern, and a VOI, a variant of interest. So those are the ones that we have seen, they have arisen, and we're just sort of keeping our eye on them to see what the story is. In the United States, we sequence about one in every 300 samples, which means we don't know exactly what's around, but as we sequence more and we see more of a particular variant, that does tend to give us some insight about what's circulating. Um, so you perhaps heard about the California variant, the UK variant, the South Africa variant, the Brazil variant. These are different versions of mistakes that the virus has made, and they do exist, and they do seem to be transmitting more easily. But the important thing to remember about these scariants is that right now, all of the vaccines that we have do help protect against these variants. If you're reading news articles that talk about the double mutant that's just been found in San Francisco, that's really scare tactics. Like that falls into scariants. Double mutant is not a scientific term. There is some concern. Um, the mutant that has been sequenced most frequently in India has now been identified in the United States. It was identified in Michigan. So there is some concern that we will um, have a lot of transmission. But again, the public health measures and the vaccinations that we have can protect, but they only work if you work them. So that means getting vaccinated, wearing masks when in indoor public uh, spaces, keeping six feet of distance from people from whom you don't know their vaccination status and doing a good job washing your hands. All right, so let's now talk about these magnificent and amazing vaccines. 
And I just wanted to show you a little bit of what I think is amazing news and, and quite frankly, nothing short of a scientific miracle. So throughout the entire world, there are six vaccines that have been authorized for use. There are eight vaccines that have received approval for full use. But let's look a little bit on this side of the timeline because there are uh, nearly, sorry, more than a hundred, not so good at math, and I'm certainly not good at math when I'm on the spot. There are more than a hundred vaccines that are still in early stages of research and development. So phase one, that's first in humans. That's the first time we test a vaccine in people. Prior to that, it only gets tested in laboratory animals. That looks at whether or not it's safe. We don't really ask whether or not it works. So there are 48 of those trials throughout the world looking to see if they have a safe candidate. There are 36 in phase two that start to look at efficacy, but look at safety in a larger group. But there are 27 vaccines that are in phase three, what's known as randomized clinical trials, really looking to see if the vaccines are safe and they're effective. And that's incredible. Um, not only that, um, they're also looking at different modalities. So my guess is there's at least one person who's on this uh, talk right now who just hates needles. You got your vaccine because you knew it was the right thing to do, but man, oh man, you would have done just about anything to not have to have had that, that physical shot. Well, I don't know if it'll pan out, but there are vaccines that are currently in trial that are looking at um, intranasal mist. So get sprayed up the nose, much like we do with pediatric flu vaccines. There are vaccines in clinical trials right now that are looking at a, a patch um, or something that goes under the tongue. So all kinds of different technology that are really intended to ensure that we can vaccinate everybody throughout the world with as few barriers as possible. All right, so I'm gonna show this, do not panic. There is no quiz coming, but I do think it's important to very, very briefly talk about how vaccines work and how it is that we develop immunity. So what we see on this side, this is essentially how the virus shows up in our body. So it enters our body typically because we have come within six feet of someone who is infected and infectious. We breathe it in. Um, the virus uses an ACE2 receptor on the surface of our cells, gets into our cells and essentially co-ops our cellular machinery and makes our cells make more of the virus. It's a sneaky little sucker, right? It's like, nah, I'm just gonna make you do my bidding. So what happens with the vaccines? We realize that this spike protein on the surface of the cell, that's what the virus is using to enter into our cells. And so that's really the most appropriate target for our immune system. So all kinds of different vaccines use different biotechnologies, but each one of them targets our spike protein. And it essentially presents a version of the spike protein to our body that our body then says, that is not supposed to be here. And it makes a response. So we make antibodies. We also make cytotoxic or killer T cells. And once we have them, they hang around in our body, sort of a ready reserve. So that if something shows up and it says, oh, there's that spike protein I saw before, then our body already has these sort of cells that it can send in to respond. None of the vaccines that are currently available for use in the United States and are considered to be available for use in the United States present the full virus. They just present the spike protein. Um, so the, the vaccine itself cannot cause COVID-19, but it can cause our body to respond to that spike protein should we get exposed to the natural virus, okay? All right, so what about these different vaccines? How are they different and why do we care? Um, so the Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines both use mRNA as their biotechnology. Um, and in our bodies, what we do is we have DNA, that's our genetic information, which we then use to create RNA. RNA is the instruction to make a protein. So what these mRNA vaccines are doing is they're essentially just injecting 
the instruction manual and telling the body, now you need to make this spike protein. And once the spike protein is there, then the immune system kicks in and says, this is the thing that I knew shouldn't be here. Let me make the response. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is the other one that's currently available in the United States. It's pretty remarkable because it's the one that is single dose. Um, and it has a lot of utility for certain populations. So people for whom it may be more difficult to get time off work, people for whom it may be more difficult um, to get two appointments, people experiencing homelessness, the incarcerated population. Um, there are a lot of groups for whom a single dose vaccine is a particularly important approach. The biotechnology it uses is an adenovirus vector. So it essentially takes a chimpanzee cold virus that can't make people sick, puts in the spike protein so that that adenovirus, that chimpanzee cold, makes a couple copies, makes the spike protein and our body responds to the spike protein. Now you probably heard a whole lot on the news about how the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines had 95% efficacy, but Johnson & Johnson was only 66%. So that is true. That's what they found in the clinical trials, but it's really important to acknowledge two things. The first is what I've put that blue arrow next to. And when we look at these vaccines and we look at the outcome of hospitalization and death, they are all equivalently effective. So the Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna did appear to be a little bit more effective at preventing people from getting any symptoms but they're all equivalently effective at preventing people from getting seriously sick and, and preventing people from dying. The other thing that's really important to note is that this isn't really comparing apples to apples because there was a very different timeline by which Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson were tested. And by the time Johnson & Johnson was being tested, the variants were already uh, circulating in the population. So we have had to go back and do studies to look at whether or not Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna work against the variants, which they do, but they do appear to work slightly less effectively at preventing all infection. Um, one other big question that um, people typically have is, will I need a booster shot? If you listen to the CEO of Pfizer, the answer is yes, but it's important to acknowledge that that came just at the time Pfizer was renegotiating their contract with the United States to buy vaccine. Um, I think right now the answer is we don't know. We do know that when people get the vaccine, their immune response persists for at least six months. So you'll notice I said at least, it's not at most. We don't know exactly how long that immunity will persist. Um, and so the most conservative assumption would be, yes, we are going to need a booster shot, perhaps one that is focused on the variants, or perhaps one to just boost our immunity. Um, you know, it might be reasonable to assume that we're going to have an annual flu COVID combo shot. Uh, there are a couple of pharmaceutical companies that are currently looking at that. Um, but right now, we just don't have very clear evidence about whether or not that is going to be necessary. All right, so let's take a look very briefly at what the situation is in the United States with respect to vaccination. Um, and you can see that there's a lot to be proud of on a national level here. So when we look at the population greater than the age of 18, um, what we can see is 40% of the population over the age of 18 is now fully vaccinated which is incredible, right? Amazing. In December, on December 10th, we said, now we have a vaccine that works. And less than five months later, we have managed to vaccinate 40% of the eligible population of the United States. But there are two really important things to recognize there. The first is what's the inverse? That means 60% of the population over the age of 18 is not yet fully vaccinated. And even if we look at the population 18 plus who's had um, at least one dose, we still have 44% of the population that is completely unvaccinated. The other thing is to look at the difference between the population 18 plus and the total population, because we know that in the United States, roughly 22% of our population is over the age, uh, excuse me, under the age of 16. So that is the group that has been completely ineligible for vaccination up until this point. 
a really, really significant part of our population that remains entirely susceptible. We'll talk about herd immunity in a little bit, but this has some pretty clear implications for our desire to achieve herd immunity, okay? Um, I also want to mention what does it mean to be fully vaccinated? So we do know that for the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines, people who have received just one dose do have some level of protection. Some of the data suggests that it may be about 80% effective after that single dose, which is incredible. We also have data that suggests 8% of the population has not, who 8% of the population who received their first dose has not received their second dose. Um, and, and so that is a concerning trend. I will say that is um, better than what we see for several other vaccines that require multiple doses, but we do wanna make sure that people understand they have to have both doses of vaccine to be considered fully vaccinated. And all of the recommendations that come from the CDC about what can you do when you're fully vaccinated, here's what that means. You have completed your series. And so if that's Pfizer or Moderna, you've received both shots, or if it's Johnson & Johnson, you've received your single shot. And then that whole process we talked about with the immune system, that takes about two weeks. So someone is not considered to be fully vaccinated until two weeks after they have completed their vaccination series. All right, so I know I'm throwing at you. So this is a horrible calendar that I have made. Um, graphic design is not one of my, my strong suits. What? You're shocked by seeing this. But I did just want to sort of lay out what that means. So I used April 1. That's really the date that um, the majority of the population in California was eligible to receive their first vaccination. And you can see because each vaccination has its own schedule to approve, they're going to be very different things. So Pfizer, if somebody received their first shot on Thursday, April 1st, they would then receive their second shot three weeks later on Thursday, April 22nd, and they would be considered to be fully immune on Thursday, May 6th. So if you got your first shot of anything that was uh, Pfizer or Moderna and you did that on April 1st, you are not yet considered to be fully vaccinated. And that's important to remember because each one of these things, if someone got vaccinated for the first time on April 15th, it all just sort of shifts the calendar. Um, Moderna, it's four weeks between first and second dose. Um, so Friday the 2nd, the second shot would have happened on Friday the 30th, and that individual would not be considered fully vaccinated until Friday the 14th. Johnson & Johnson, it's two weeks after the only dose. So if someone got vaccinated on April 3rd, they would be fully immune on April 17th. So as you can see, that is one of the big advantages of the Johnson & Johnson. Someone is going to be considered fully vaccinated much, much sooner if they receive Johnson & Johnson than if they receive the Pfizer or the Moderna. That could have important implications, for example, if there is mandatory travel that someone has to undertake or someone has to have a medical procedure, we want them to be fully vaccinated before those things happen. All right. Um, so I want to mention, there was a lot of news recently, and I just want to mention what breakthrough infection is and what it means. Um, so we know that these vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, they're about 95% effective. Now that does mean 5% of the people who receive the vaccine will not mount a full immune response. Typically it's related to having some sort of immunocompromising condition. We know that people who are older tend to have a less robust immune response. So if the question is, can you get COVID after being fully vaccinated? The answer is yes, but it's really, really rare. And this is what we saw in the United States. Out of more than 87 million people who were fully vaccinated, there were 7,157 breakthrough infections. So 87 million people fully vaccinated, 7,000 infections in that group. Um, that's less than one per 12,000 people. So it's basically 0.008%. Uh, so can it happen? Yes, it can. 
If you have symptoms of COVID after being fully vaccinated, you should still seek out a COVID test, but it is so exceedingly rare. Um, it's one of those things you kind of have to mention, but you don't necessarily want people to kind of hang on to. Of course, um, this got a tremendous amount of news attention, but I just wanna make sure it's clear from an epidemiologic perspective, this is what we expected would happen knowing this is an incredible vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, but they're not perfect. It is also important to mention that of 87 million people, there were 88 people who did still die. Um, and the majority of those individuals were um, older. And it was really thought that sort of having those comorbid or compromising conditions really contributed. All right. So, um, talked a fair bit about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And because of the pause that happened, I just want to take a minute and talk a little bit more about J&J &J and sort of what it means about our system. Um, so I talked a little bit about phase one, phase two, phase three. So even in phase three trials, we typically only test, it's about 40,000 people. 20,000 receive the placebo, 20,000 receive the candidate vaccine. Then we look to see um, how many infections happen in each group, and we look at side effects and adverse events. The fact that these significant adverse events were seen with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, as well as with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not approved for use in the United States, but uses the exact same biotechnology, the fact that we saw it and that the FDA and CDC immediately recommended a pause in the use of the vaccine that actually means the system is working exactly as it was designed. There were more than 6.8 million doses of Johnson & Johnson given in the United States, and the rate of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or this very rare clot, was about one per million doses. So statistically, there is no way that would have been noticed in the clinical trial. That's why after vaccines come on the market, we do post marketing surveillance. So there is an entire system and infrastructure by which we look at whether or not there are adverse events that are associated with the receipt of the vaccine. So a lot of people say, um, and I will tell you that I recommended several members of my family, most of whom are um, a little needle phobic. I did recommend that they get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So if that gives you a sense of how strongly I, I believe in this vaccine and its utility and value for certain populations. Now, that said, um, now that we have an abundance of all of the different vaccines, I think it's perfectly reasonable for someone to say, I would prefer to receive the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine because there does seem to be this risk of blood clots. Um, the most important thing about the pause, besides the fact that it helped us ensure that the system was working, the pause really was critical to ensure that physicians sort of knew to look for this and thought about how to treat it. Because the way that this specific condition gets treated is actually different from the way a clot would normally be treated. So by pausing, the CDC and the FDA had an opportunity to look at the data, to investigate whether this was a correlation or they thought it was causation. Um, and it gave an opportunity to really widely message to physicians, if you have a patient who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the last one to three weeks, do look out for this clot. And if you find that they have it, here's how you should appropriately treat it. It is really, really important to note that this is extremely rare, and it has only been seen associated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. All right, so let's turn to some good news. Um, and I am assuming many of you saw this yesterday. Um, it was a huge headline. So on March 31st, Pfizer-BioNTech announced the results of their vaccine study in adolescents. So these are individuals between the ages of 12 and 15. Um, they have then submitted all of these results and all of this paperwork to the FDA so that they can extend the emergency use authorization. Um, and in all likelihood, so, Today is May 4th. In all likelihood, by a week from now, we will have an extension of the authorization for those 12 to 15. And importantly, because the dose is exactly the same 
for 12 to 15 year olds, that means we can immediately begin vaccinating this group. Um, so I would not be surprised if 12 to 15 year olds will be eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccine by um, like May 10th or May 11th. Um, so a big question, uh, what about smaller kids? Um, so Pfizer is now running their clinical trial in six months old, six month olds up until 12 years of age. Um, for those of you who are in the Silicon Valley office, Stanford is actually one of the major study sites. And to just give you a sense of the confidence that sort of many of my colleagues have, many Stanford physicians who have children in this age group have enrolled their own children in the clinical trial. So that's how strongly they feel that this vaccine is safe and this vaccine is effective. They are signing their own kids up to participate in the clinical trial. Now, what does that mean with respect to timing? Um, I think it, in all likelihood, we're not gonna see a vaccine for this age group, the six month to 12 year old age group, probably until the beginning of 2022. Because of the way we run clinical trials, we have to wait for the accumulation of outcomes. So we essentially have to wait for kids to get COVID and we see a certain number of cases of COVID before they begin to analyze the data. One of the things we've seen from data that's come out of Israel is that as we vaccinate more and more adults, we have many, many fewer cases in children, which means it's gonna take longer to achieve those endpoints. But I think it's incredible news for 12 to 15 year olds, the, the vaccine, is likely to be available very, very soon. Um, and I think it will be another important step in helping us to achieve uh, herd immunity. Um, the other thing is that Pfizer, as a publicly traded company, they have to announce to their shareholders what their plans are. They are applying for full authorization. You need six months of safety data to apply for full approval, so not just emergency use. And Pfizer is making that application to the FDA. Um, and that may have some important implications because there are individuals who have expressed vaccine hesitancy, particularly around the idea that um, it's not fully approved. So that full approval should make a difference. I know that there are also entities that have expressed hesitancy about making rules about whether or not they can require vaccine under an emergency use authorization. All right. So what does this all mean? Um, and for those of you who are in California offices, it's important to note that the goal in the state of California is to reopen the state in its entirety on June 15th. Um, so if we continue to have sufficient progress with respect to hospitalizations, we are going to see Disneyland opened on April 30th. We're going to see concerts come back. We're going to see life starting to look much more like it used to um, as we continue to have more people vaccinated and we have sufficient hospital capacity to appropriately treat those who do get infected. All right, so you've all been fully vaccinated or you plan to be fully vaccinated soon. What does that mean for you? Um, and essentially the take home message right now is that once you are fully vaccinated, the only time you have to wear a mask is if you are visiting indoors with people who are at increased risk for severe illness and if you're attending large gatherings. So I said concerts are coming back. Realistically, concerts are probably coming back with masks when they do come back. But one of the big reasons to get vaccinated besides you protect yourself from severe disease, besides you protect those who are most vulnerable in the community, is that your mask can start to sort of move to the back of the closet in the, I will only have to occasionally wear the mask to ensure that myself and my family members are safe. So more detail, I'm not 100% certain that the CDC has been exceptionally helpful in releasing this image because there's so much happening here but let me sort of break it down. What we have on this side is if you are fully vaccinated, when do you have to wear a mask given you'd like to maintain maximum level of safety? And much of that depends on the people with whom you are going to be interacting, right? So part of the really big news is that vaccinated people no longer need to wear a mask when they're outdoors in the state of California. 
And that's pretty awesome, um, particularly as summer is coming and there's nobody who would say, you know what's really comfortable to wear when it's warm outside? My triple layer mask. So I think that's amazing news. Um, there are definitely still questions. Uh, number one, how do you know who's vaccinated? So if you don't know someone's vaccination status, even if you're outdoors, you probably are still gonna want to maintain your six feet of distance. The other thing is um, you see attend a crowded outdoor event. There's not really anything that's exceptionally clear about what does it mean to be crowded. Um, and I think a good rule to keep in mind is six feet of distance. If you can maintain six feet of distance, you probably don't need a mask. If you're gonna get within six feet of someone else, so you're gonna be at a farmer's market and everybody's looking at the same peaches, best to just keep your mask on. Um, we can also see that there are some things, indoor movie theaters, full capacity worship services, singing in an indoor chorus, we're still gonna be wearing masks for a while just because the risk is much higher in those circumstances. Um, I can't think of anything that would be much more uncomfortable than wearing a mask through a really serious spin class, um, but you'll notice that still participating in indoor high intensity, if you're exercising and you're doing it right, you are breathing really heavy. That heavy breathing can force any droplets farther out. Um, so for those groups, it's still masking regardless of vaccination status. The other thing, we know that there now are households that are mixed. And in particular, any household that has a child right now under the age of 15 is going to be a mixed household because we don't have vaccines yet approved for this group. I think within the next month or two, we're gonna be moving towards any household with a child under the age of 12. Um, but importantly, if you have two households mixing where everybody in the household is fully vaccinated, you actually don't need any prevention measures. So you can have friends over, indoors, eating, mask-free. Um, if you are mixing with one other household where the entirety of the household is not vaccinated, but they're at low risk, this would be children who are immunocompetent. We also say no prevention measures are needed. Um, if you have two households mixing where anybody is at high risk and they're not vaccinated, we still want to see prevention measures taken. And then you'll notice um, when it's just one household, we say no prevention measures, but if a fully vaccinated household is mixing with more than one unvaccinated household, even if everybody is at low risk, um, this for example might be you know, a five-year-old's birthday party, we'd still say even if all the adults are vaccinated, probably a better idea to have that birthday party outdoors or to have everybody wearing masks just to be safe. I know this is probably not the first time you're seeing this, but my colleague, um, Ian McKay, who's an Australian virologist, which helps explain some of his slightly funky spelling, um, came up with the Swiss cheese respiratory virus pandemic defense. And there are a couple things here that I think are really critical to look at. The first is that vaccines are incredibly powerful, but they're all the way over on this end of the diagram. So they're not the only tool that we have. We have all of these options that can help keep us safer. Um, and that's really important when we think about these scariants, right? Do we need to be worried if our vaccines seem less effective? There's a laboratory study in mice that indicated they, they may have been less effective. We still have all of these other measures. The other thing that's really important is the incredible facility of uh, mRNA biotechnology. So January 10th, the SARS-CoV-2 genome was sequenced. January 15th, scientists from Moderna came to the NIH and said, we have a candidate vaccine. So five days. So if there is a variant that comes up that is concerning, there is a very, very short window that is necessary to create that booster, should it be needed. And again, I'm not saying it is needed. I'm saying if it is necessary. The other thing that I think is really powerful about uh, Dr. McKay's image is these misinformation mice. And, and part of the reason I think it's so amazing that Samson offers you this opportunity to hear more about the pandemic, to hear more about vaccines, is because it's one of the most effective way to combat these misinformation mice. People who are posting on Facebook, they're posting all over the internet about 
I heard this and it changes your menstrual cycle and it's going to make you infertile. It does not, it will not. Um, and, and so really having access to the most accurate information can help keep each one of these layers as intact as possible with the recognition that we are going to use these layers together. Someone asked me today, um, you know, do we think that hand hygiene should persist even as COVID-19 is going away? It's like, you know, as an infectious disease epidemiologist, I kind of thought that hand hygiene shouldn't have been a new thing in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and I certainly hope we're all going to continue washing our hands and using cough etiquette and not coming into our physical workspace if we have symptoms, putting our, uh, you know, our colleagues at risk. So each one of these things can continue to persist in some capacity to help keep the entire population safe. Um, Lindsay Marr, who is at Virginia Tech, came up with the two of three rule. And this really comes down to how do you behave if you don't know the vaccination status of others? So if you're outside and you're at least six feet away, even if you don't know if someone's vaccinated, you probably don't need a mask. But if either of those criteria do not hold true, if you're getting within six feet or you are indoors, at least for the time being, it's probably still a good idea to mask up. Um, so some of the big questions I get, what is the rest of 2021 going to look like? Um, I particularly like this sign that was posted, the Majestic, first you get the vaccine, then you get the concerts. Um, things are going to start coming back. We are going to start seeing indoor concerts. We are going to start seeing um, the opportunity to have children return to in-person school five days a week. Um, it is all going to come back. We likely will be wearing masks on transportation, so in airplanes, that's probably gonna happen for quite some time. Um, but you're gonna be able to return to in-person worship services. Uh, you're gonna be able to go get a haircut. Um, all of the things that, that people have been avoiding, that is all starting to come back and it will continue to come back. I know there are a lot of questions about vaccine passports and what does it mean and how does it work? One thing I wanna say is, um, anyone who's traveled internationally, particularly to many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, it's not new to have to present proof of your vaccination to enter into a country. So quite a few countries in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and in South America, you can't enter the country unless you provide proof that you've had your yellow fever vaccine. So it's not a new thing to require someone to provide proof of vaccination. Uh, the EU just announced earlier this week that they are welcoming fully vaccinated tourists starting in June. How logistically that will work exactly, how they will be operationalized, that part is not entirely clear because there is no single global system. Um, but in general, there is some sort of app that gets downloaded to your mobile phone. Um, you create an account with some form of biometric data. So that could be thumbprint or that could be face ID. You upload your vaccination data and then you get a QR code that can be scanned at a number of different places. There are some options for people to present negative test results in lieu of presenting um, vaccination. But in many, many countries, they are not going to allow just negative test results without mandatory quarantine. So for example, and take it out of foreign countries, if you want to go to Hawaii right now, you have to either provide proof of a negative test result or you have to quarantine for 10 days when you arrive. Not the way I would choose to spend my Hawaiian vacation, but some people are still choosing to do so. All right, the last thing I want to mention um, is this idea of herd immunity and how it works. So there was a, an article that came out yesterday in the New York Times where several of my colleagues were quoted essentially saying we're not going to achieve herd immunity. One thing I wouldn't really reinforce, herd immunity is not a light switch, right? It's not like I hit 70%, we're good to go, we are herd immune. It's really, um, it's a probability issue. What is the probability that someone who is infected and infectious is going to come into contact with someone who is susceptible? And it relies on an equal and even distribution of individuals who are susceptible throughout the population. And part of the problem is we know that's just not true, right? So I talked about the fact that older adults are um, less likely, even when they have received both vaccines, 
they're less likely to develop that full immunity. The problem we know is a lot of older adults live closely together with other older adults, whether it's in a nursing home or whether it's in a retirement community. So if they're all bunched together and we have one infected person show up, we are going to see transmission of the virus. Um, we actually use the infectivity in order to calculate what level of um, the population needs to be immune to generate herd immunity. And one of the reasons you have seen a lot of shift in this number, last year we assumed it was 70%, now we think it's probably at least 85%, is because these new variants do appear to be more transmissible and that changes the whole calculation. The other thing to remember in the short term, we are not going to achieve herd immunity because 22% of the population, even if 100% of the 16 plus population was willing to get vaccinated, there were no barriers to vaccination, that still leaves 22% of the population totally ineligible because of age at this moment. So we need children to be vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity, number one. And number two, well, we need to remove as many barriers as possible to encourage people to get vaccinated. We need to have conversations with people to ensure they feel comfortable and confident um, I think it's one of the reasons it's amazing that you hosted a vaccine clinic at Samsung. There's literally nothing easier than showing up at your own workplace and being able to receive vaccine. We're going to need a lot more of those initiatives in order to make sure we are uh, protecting the population. All right, uh, I just wanted to make sure you have access um, to both national and state level resources uh, for the most up-to-date information. And if you have any specific questions, you're more than welcome to email me.